Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, and this week for our big train tour here at the Colorado Railroad Museum, we're going to be taking on the subject of snow fighting. When you think about Colorado railroads and snow, what comes to mind? Well, maybe a tourist train like the Manitou and Pikes Peak taking you up to the snowy peak of Pikes Peak, but probably rotary snow plows or a heavy wedge plow bucking its way over the tall mountain passes of Colorado with snow everywhere. And that is the kind of image that we find in Colorado history books and in some of the most famous pictures about this state and railroading. But there's a lot more to the story. And today we're actually going to take a look at several items in the museum's collection that together help in the fight against snow. As with most aspects of railroading, there is much more to snow removal than these famous pictures suggest. There are a number of specialized vehicles that aid in ensuring that snow removal accomplishes its larger goal of keeping trains on the tracks and operating. And then there are other inventions, such as switch heaters, which have a large role to play in making sure that trains can still move about even in winter snow and ice. And finally, don't forget the good old-fashioned shovel. Propelled by a railroad worker, it too has a role to play in the management of snow. This is Denver and Rio Grande Western Flanger OC. But what's a flanger, you ask? Well, even small amounts of wintry precipitation can impact the railroad environment. Snow and ice can build up between the rails and cause potential derailments. The flanger has this blade. It's actually on both sides of this car. And it can be raised up so as to avoid switches and road crossings and similar obstructions. But the rest of the time, you want it down, digging out the ice and snow between the rails. Flanger OC was built circa 1885 to 1887 and originally numbered Denver and Rio Grande Railroad number one. It was renumbered to OC in 1907, and then in 1930, the car was rebuilt with this steel underframe that you can see. Before that, it was a completely wood bodied car. This is the first stop on our tour today because flangers are the first line of defense in snow fighting. But once more snow and ice build up, you've got to move on to the next level of snow fighting. The next tool in our snow fighting arsenal is called a Jordan spreader. Jordan spreaders have long plows extending out to the side, which can be retracted so as to not strike signals and buildings alongside the tracks. And if you think about more than one track in an operating environment, you've got to keep moving the snow across those tracks. So these are your first two tools in the arsenal are the flanger and then the spreader. We don't have a spreader here in the collection at the Colorado Railroad Museum, but there is one preserved on the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railway over on the Colorado-New Mexico border. When snow starts to fall fast or the drifts begin to blow and pile up, it's time to bring out railroading's bigger guns in the fight against snow. Snow plows come in two forms. There's the wedge, which goes back to the early days of railroading, you're essentially just plowing into the snow and moving it aside by force. And there's the rotary, which has big blades spinning around, whirling the snow and chopping it up and flinging it off to the side. Wedge plows have one major limitation. If snow builds up too deep, the plow may simply get stuck and no amount of locomotives can push it and the snow out of the way. This model here is from the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. It's actually fairly late. It was built in 1949 out of an old flat car 
been used on the Burlington's Sterling, Colorado to Cheyenne, Wyoming line. The blade on this can actually be lifted up flat such that another car can be coupled together with this flat car so that you can move it around. Rocks and other heavy materials were added to the deck of the flat car in order to add weight and thus traction so that while the car was being pushed, it wouldn't have a tendency to hop off the rails. Rotary snow plows were invented in the late 19th century, and they really, truly became Raritan's big guns for snow removal. Their success lies not so much in the fact that they plow snow, but rather they chew it up and spit it out off to the side, much like a snowblower works. And this is really important when you think about Raritan because you not only need to get the snow off the tracks, but in a mountain environment, you need to get it over the side of the hill. Rotary snow plows are expensive to maintain and to operate, however. And some winters, they aren't even needed because snowfall is light or nicely spaced out, which means that the flangers and the spreaders can do the whole job all winter long. But individual railroads still tend to keep a few around, even if it's only a very limited number on hand and ready for service. Here in Colorado and throughout the West, rotary snow plows remain a necessity even today, simply because winter storms often bring sudden and large accumulations of snow that cannot otherwise be quickly and efficiently moved by any other means. So this rotary snow plow with its long number 99201 started life because the South Park line needed a second rotary snow plow. The first one, which was built for the Denver South Park and Pacific, a predecessor to the Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison, was based at Como and helped to clear the line to Leadville and up through Alpine Tunnel to Gunnison and around the surrounding area, which has, as many of you know, plenty of snowfall. So the Colorado and Southern Railway, which then became the predecessor to those previously mentioned railroads, ordered a second rotary from the Cook Locomotive Works in 1899. And that's this one, which was delivered in 1900. Now here's the fun part of this story. So this rotary was built in 1900. It's delivered to Denver as a standard gauge rotary snowplow, probably because it would have been easier to ship on its own wheels. So then it ha it's, uh, it's taken into the shop and narrow gauged sent on up to Como as a narrow gauge rotary where they start to test it and they discover it's, it's heavier than the older one and so it's a little too heavy for the line and it doesn't fit through the Alpine Tunnel. Somebody made some kind of a measuring mistake. So, well, that didn't work well for what they had bought it for, so it sat around for a couple years, ends up coming back down to the flatlands, gets standard gauged and does a bunch of service in and around northern Colorado and up into Wyoming. So in 1935 that other snow plow, the earlier one for this line, was involved in an engine house fire in Como. So all of a sudden it's out of service. This snow plow gets narrow gauged once again and sent back up to help plow the line. The winter of 1935 and 1936 saw both of the rotaries, because they had fixed the other one by then, both of these were in service between Denver and Leadville, keeping the line open. But then, since the other one was back, this one gets sent back down to the flatlands and standard gauged once again. Our snowplow Number 99201 was converted back to standard gauge again and returned to Cheyenne after an extensive rebuild at the joint Burlington, Colorado, and Southern Denver shops in 1949. Here's the kicker. In 1951, the rotary was once again sent up to Leadville to replace that older snowplow, which had suffered a broken drive wheel shaft caused by metal fatigue. This snowplow pushed along by a steam locomotive and later on by a diesel, plays out its life 
in the region where it was built first to serve, but in a different gauge. But think about it. Standard gauge, narrow gauge, standard gauge, narrow gauge, standard gauge. So it's been standard gauge three times and narrow gauge twice in its history. And that's not even starting to talk about the machine itself. So a rotary snowplow like this was powered by steam. That steam was turning a steam engine in order to crank this drive shaft. It's reversible so it can spin one way or the other. The blades through centrifugal force dig into the snow such that they're chopping at it and of course it's got this neat little drill auger sort of thing at the front. But again, because it operates more like a snowblower, you have to be able to change the direction you throw the snow. Right now this one's set up to throw it in this direction, but this whole thing could be just quickly rearranged to throw it in the other direction. And again, that whole idea of getting the snow over the side of the mountain and as far away from the tracks as possible is our goal. So, a final note to our program on snow fighting today. Many locomotives, and for that matter, self-propelled rail cars like Goose Number no. 7, in the wintertime will carry a service plow. The idea being that if a little bit of snow gets in the way, it can be easily pushed aside. So, look around next time in the railroad environment. In wintertime, you might notice those plows still on locomotives because they still come in handy today. Thanks for joining us as we've been learning about how to fight snow in the railroad environment. If you enjoy our content, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Sharing and commenting in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.